Carnival Lights by Chris Stark The Village of Park Point, August 3, 1860 The carnival came to town, but not until after the Indian bones were excavated. Under the red beam of the Minnesota Point Lighthouse, cast by a fourth-order Fresno lens and illuminated by a kerosene lamp, a motley assortment of Finnish, German, and French men wielding spades and pickaxes broke joints, cracked femurs, shattered fingers, and split the skulls of those buried long before Europeans set foot on the shores of the westernmost tip of Gichigami. A former John Jacob Astor agent, in concert with the acting mayor of the unincorporated town of Duluth, made the decision to build a carnival to brighten the dour mood of the sixty-odd dwelling on the shore and the few hundred in the logging and mining camps nearby. Although a hefty investment with questionable immediate return, the two men had plans for the port and needed to attract hundreds and eventually thousands more European immigrants to build the city. Once others heard of the grand carnival held there, they believed, Europeans would come in droves. They were sitting on a gold mine of trade prospects now that they had moved the Indians off the shoreline closer to Fond du Lac. The Indian graveyard had been a problem. They did not need a child or lady kicking up a bone during the carnival and causing a sensation, frightening business to St. Paul or Chicago. So the bones were hacked out of the soil by criminal castaways and thrown into a wagon drawn by a single draft horse lent by a man who used the horse to clear tree stumps from the burgeoning township. That is how the Indian bones traveled to their new home, nearly three miles down the river that flowed southward out of the Great Lake. Two days after the removal, guided by the red beam of light, the Arawak steamer brought in supplies, a large metal wheel that hitched to a horse directly across from a wooden bench, such that as a horse walk in circles, patrons rode the bench for four spins a penny around a 15-foot wide path. Called the Sweetheart Ride, it was the center attraction for the first ever carnival on the spit of land overlooking Gichigami that was now on the maps as Lake Superior. The ride was the motivating factor behind George Washington Gale Ferris Jr.'s invention of the Ferris wheel, which would make its first appearance at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, commemorating the 400-year anniversary of Christopher Columbus's landing on the archipelago inhabited by the Taino people and designed to be direct competition to the Eiffel Tower of the 1889 Paris Exposition. Four days later, a four-wagon caravan arrived carrying workers, canvases, rope, steaks, lard, bags of flour, potatoes, and dried pork, and wood that transformed into four tents, including a sideshow of Savage Joe and his squaw, a whole chunk Indian man, and a brother town mixed blood Indian woman who looked full blood. For three days they set up camp, washed clothes on the rocks along the shoreline, mended costumes, and cooked. After considerable labor by the carnival workers that extended late into the evenings under torchlight, the townspeople gathered for their first carnival on the Indian cemetery. Savage Indian Joe and his pretend wife rubbed okra over their faces and arms, down to goose feather headdresses unlike anything any of their ancestors ever wore, and lunged around a tent, waving their hands in the air and screaming gibberish, frightening women and children alike who paid a penny to sit on wooden benches and watch the heathens. An old French fur trader familiar with Indian ways looked into the future and knew that this would not end well. The rest enjoyed the frightful show, sucking on the sour, birch, peppermint, lavender, and whorehound candies, while basking in the torchlights that removed the cold, loneliness, and hunger they endured thousands of miles from their land on the other side of the Atlantic. The Indians in the carnival made them feel superior not only to the red man, but to the squalor that they themselves lived in. One month later, after the carnival slogged westward over rutted paths, an old Chippewa Indian lady living in a wigwam far enough out in the woods that the English, as she called all Europeans, had not removed her to the Fond du Lac reservation yet, walked seven miles alone to the site of her parents and her parents' parents, and her parents' 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 graves. Born in 1784, her grandmother had told her one night when she was a girl of nine that their people knew the time would come when more and more English would arrive, first by ships over water and later by ships in the air, bringing great death and destruction, the windigo, the cannibal spirit.
The old Chippewa lady's grandmother told her that the English would make many lights that would guide the water and airships to the land. One day there would be so many lights they would no longer see the stars and barely know the difference between day and night. All those lights, the old woman added, would make it hard for the Indians to see the star people, our guardians and guides, and we will slowly lose our ways. The lights will steal our people. The old Chippewa lady, then a girl, stepped outside the wigwam to look at the star people. Hundreds of bright lights in the black sky. Her dog, Animush, stood watch at the edge of the clearing. The moon hung full, just over the tops of the bare tree branches, their leaves the size of beaver ears. She couldn't imagine it, what her grandmother said about not being able to see the old ones. She bit a piece of tree candy her Nokomis had given her and slipped inside the wigwam, nestling into the warmth of her grandmother's belly and the beaver pelts they slept in. Now stooped in a long skirt with a red willow basket over one arm, the old Chippewa lady wandered the shoreline where the carnival had been, occasionally bending over, setting something she picked from the rocky shoreline into her basket. Unseen, except by a curious Finnish boy who watched her, she moved through the village of Park Point with the boy like a white shadow behind her. Crossing the spit of land into the unincorporated town of Duluth, a stray hound whose Finnish master had died six days after arriving on a ship, leaving the dog to fend for herself, lunged at the old Indian woman, flinging the contents of her baskets onto the dirt. The old lady yelled words unintelligible to the boy and kicked the dog in the face, scaring it away. Kneeling, she regathered the contents of her basket and dis disappeared behind an Englishman's tar paper shack. The young boy ran to where the woman had disappeared. Seeing no one, he searched the ground as he had overheard men discussing their quest for rocks that would make them wealthier than the czar. Whoever that was, he thought. The boy's mother had recently died giving birth to a baby sister who also died. His eight-year-old sister took over cooking, sewing, and stoking the fire at night while their father searched for work in the logging camps further north. The children were starving. Near where the dog bit the old woman, his eye caught a pearly white shape in the dirt. Grabbing it, thinking perhaps it would be the special rock the men had talked about, the boy ran lest one of the men take what he had found. Long and smooth, about the length of the boy's middle finger, he gave it to his sister, who mistook it for a bird bone and boiled it in the water she'd collected from the great lake for their dinner that night, and the next night, and the next, and then the one after that. East. In Ojibwe ways, the east direction is where the Ojibwe come from. It is the spiritual direction. Pine Township, Minnesota, Goodhue Reservation, August 1969. The blazing red and blue light from the cruiser careened off the windows, utensils, and faces of the women and men eating at the truck stop diner. No one paid much attention. Cher Brown moved slowly, paid the cashier, a woman in her mid-twenties who looked ten years older, with one rumpled dollar and some change damp with perspiration. The woman nodded absently, turning her back to the girl and the carnival colors lighting up the inside of the truck stop diner like it was the 4th of July. Cher took the hunk of homemade cornbread wrapped in plastic with a red daled sticker on the side holding it all together and put it in her pack along with two damp cans of Coke, some face makeup, a sky blue, Bic lighter, and a pack of gum. The important thing, she thought, was to not panic. The cop was not there for them. Moving slowly, methodically, she kept her face as impenetrable as those around her. Deep caverns of darkness garishly lighted up by each cycle of lights. If they knew it all, they thought they were on their way to Fargo. If the APBs were out on the girls, they would be looking north, northwest, and they were on the southern edge of the Goodhue Reservation, zigzagging south, southwest, headed to Minneapolis, where she knew someone who knew someone, or they could camp out by the river until they found jobs and moved on. Whenever the girls had discussed leaving, Cher had always talked of returning by spring in time to put the seeds in the ground with the hope her brother would have already left for the war. Chris listened to her cousin, older than her by two months and six days, but she did not reply. Chris knew she was not going back. Cher strapped the pack over her left shoulder and looked at the woman's back. 
She glanced through the empty convenience store section, and then again at the women and men eating Paul bunion sized portions of mashed potatoes, peas, gravy, roast beef, and drinking iced tea and Cokes out of red dimple plastic tumblers half a foot tall. She walked out in a long stride that belied the actual length of her legs, careful to set her heavy steel toe boots down softly on the concrete floor so as not to draw attention to herself. Cher saw the cop through the front pane of glass. He walked around to the entrance and opened the door, alarming the leftover brass Christmas bells swinging above the top, hanging down just far enough to be nicked every time someone came or went. She wiped her arms across her forehead and looked down at her nails, short and thick after years of drinking fresh raw milk and baling hay and shoveling manure. The cop stopped and stood in front of the door, blocking her exit. Girl. Cher looked up. The cop met her eyes and looked from her sweatshirt to her jeans to her boots. She saw Injun on his face, in the way his eyes tightened and how his jaw set. She shifted the weight of the pack, nodded, leaned into the door, and walked out. It was raining outside, a light drizzle, the kind that would be good for the crops right about now. They had enough rain that season to keep things green and growing. Too much rain would do in the crops with mildew and weaken the root systems, and too little rain combined with too much sun could still dry up the crops before harvest. She squinted her eyes to the flashing lights and headed off to the right. She walked across the concrete to the other side of the diesel pumps until she reached some medium length grass and sparse white weeds with heads as soft as the noses of the young cows back on the farm. She cut up under the dogwood and set foot down a slight hill. The moon hung full and ominous, low in the sky. Cher thought of her grandmother, Ethel Mae Brown, passed over nearly a year now. A bunch of bunk, her grandmother said when the radio discussed the astronauts' training schedules or the date of their scheduled flight, July 20th, 1969. She'd swat the air with her hand. Yeah, sure, they're on the moon now planting their flag. White people say anything and take everything. I want to thank you for your time listening to me on my uh, book, Carnival Lights, which is due out in April 2021, released by Modern History Plus, available anywhere books are sold. Uh, miigwech, and have a good day.